the health of the soil, I think, is really important. It will build that organic matter so that everything will drain better, retain moisture better. And the deeper your organic matter, the more nitrogen you could pull from the atmosphere. You could gain about 60 pounds of nitrogen just from the atmosphere with really healthy soil, and it'll sequester carbon. So the more people are using products like this, the better our environment's going to be. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming Anne Malloy to the podcast. Anne and her family own and operate Ocean Crest Seafoods in Gloucester, Massachusetts, but you might know them better for the Neptune's Harvest organic fertilizer that they make. One of our missions on this podcast, in addition to interviewing a bunch of farmers, is to talk with the entire support system for market farmers. And since fish fertilizers were some of the original organic fertilizers and many growers, like us, have used fish fertilizer at some point, we wanted to have Anne on to hear what we can learn about making and using fish fertilizer. So, without further ado, welcome to the Growing for Market podcast, Anne. Hey, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Yeah, sure. Um, can you tell us about the beginnings of Neptune's Harvest? Uh, tell us where you're based and how and when you got your start. Sure. So we're in Gloucester, Massachusetts, which is a big fishing port. It's actually the oldest working seaport in America. If you ever saw the perfect storm or wicked tuna, that that's, that's where we are. Um, so we have had a seafood company in our family for, you know, almost 100 years. And in the 80s, there was a fish plant in Gloucester that took the fish remains and made pet food, and they went out of business. And at that point, we were forced to pay fishermen to take the gurry, we call it gurry, which is the fish remains, which is like 60 to 70% of the fish left over. And they brought it back out to sea and dumped it overboard. So it was expensive. It was wasteful. And um, my dad at the time saw a big opportunity instead of throwing it away to turn it into fertilizer and, you know, be a great source of organic nutrients. He said, I have like five kids working here, nieces, nephews, cousins, and maybe if we can use 100% of the fish and not throw away 60%, 70%, we could keep everybody employed. And that's how we ended up in the fertilizer business. Yeah. Well, that does that makes sense. Do you know how much of a process it was to um, turn that gurry, if I got the word right, into the fish guts and stuff into um, into fish fertilizer? I mean, I imagine it's it's not as simple as just throwing it in a giant blender and blending it up, or or is it? Uh, not at all. So. We got together with the University of Massachusetts Marine Station and they helped us develop the process. And then we bought some machinery from Norway and flew some Norwegian people over here to help us get it set up. But it literally took 10 years and about $1 million to perfect it. Wow. Um, and is that because they were already making a similar product? Were they in fish fertilizer in Norway? Yes, I do believe they had the process over there, and that's why we had to get the technology from them. At the time, there was nobody else doing it here the way we wanted to do it with the cold process and, you know, making sure it was the highest quality available. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, can you tell us um, a bit more about how it's made? And, and so, I mean, I guess we got what, what goes into it. It's I assume it's everything... Are we talking all fish here? Or is it like crabs and lobsters and stuff like that? Um, or is it, uh, I guess we got an idea of what goes into it. So how how is it made? So yeah, um, the fish fertilizer, it doesn't have any shellfish in it. That's a separate product. But we okay. unload fishing boats. So it's all, it's probably 15 to 20 different species of fish. Haddock, cod, flounder, hake, cusk, pollock, all different fish that people eat. And so we unload the fishing boats, we fillet the fish, and then the 
60 to 70% left over. We grind it up the same day while it's still fresh, not stinky at all. And it goes through like a big grinder, like an auger, and it comes out looking like hamburger. And then it goes into hydrolyzing tanks where these high powered pumps whip it around. And between the natural enzymes in the fish and the high powered pumps, it liquefies within 24 hours. And then we stabilize it with just enough phosphoric acid to bring the pH down to 3.5, and that keeps it stable. So it has an indefinite shelf life until you add water. Once you add water, the pH goes up and you have to use it right up. And then we screen it through a 150 micron screen. So it looks like cloth, it's such a fine screen, and that takes out any of the bigger bone particles that didn't dissolve in the hydrolyzing process which basically means taking a solid, making it into a liquid with the use of enzymes. So the natural enzymes in the fish make it a hydrolyzed fish product as opposed to a fish emulsion. And after it's screened, it goes into a 10,000 gallon mixing tank. So no matter what kind of fish we process day to day, it helps keep it much more uniform by going into the 10,000 gallon mixing tank. And then from there, it goes into holding tanks. We have four 30,000 gallon holding tanks and 10 2,500 gallon holding tanks. So we, um, and then when we pump it into the drums or totes, then we rescreen it again. So it's, it's double filtered. And then from the totes, we, we run our bottling machine for the smaller packages. And we have a 5,000 gallon tank of truck. Um, that we can send out to farms. We have 275 gallon bulk totes, 55 gallon drums, and then five gallon pails and all the retail um, smaller sizes. Yeah. Okay. Cause I think, I think that's how we've gotten it before as a five gallon bucket, but I did, um, I did notice on your website that you offer to send the tanker truck out to people, which was kind of blew my mind to think of about that much um, fish fertilizer in any one place, but it sounds like you've got much larger tanks than that just to hold the product does anybody ever order the tanker truck the tractor trailer truck full of fish fertilizer oh absolutely february march april may june he's on the road constantly he's been to montana several times he's been to texas florida he goes to indiana new york Ohio. So yes, we're very busy with that tanker truck. We sell to a lot of big farms um, that do hay and pasture and all sorts of different, um, you know, vegetables and, um, you know, field crops. Yeah. Okay. That, well, that makes sense then. Cause I, you know, my, my mindset is, is um, I think at the scale that a lot of our listeners are, or I assume they are being a, um, small, medium size, uh, mixed vegetable and flower farm. I, I was thinking, you know, we might go through a couple five gallon buckets in a season. So, okay. That makes sense if they're applying it to field crops or something like that. So has the, has it changed a lot from that original formulation in the eighties or was it sort of like, sounds like you had to work on that formulation for a while. Is it once you got the, got the product, is it pretty similar to the, um, the original? Has it changed a lot over the years? Um, no, once we got it right, which, like I said, took about 10 years after that, we've got it dialed in and it hasn't changed um, at all. So that's, you know, we've added to the line with new products, but the fish, you know, itself is is the same product for a long time. If anything's changed, our screening processes have gotten better over the years. Mm hmm. OK, um, well, and I, I wanted to make sure and ask, I know you just made the distinction between what you make and a fish emulsion. So what is the difference between Neptune's and fish emulsion? So ours is a cold process hydrolyzed fish. The only thing removed is the filet that people eat. Uh, Fish emulsion is mostly menhaden caught in the Gulf of Mexico or the Chesapeake Bay. And they remove the meal for fish meal products pet food, things like that. Mm -hmm. Then they remove the oil for fish oil products. And then the wastewater that's left after those two processes, they boil down to a 50% solution. And that's what fish emulsion is. So it still works, but ours works so much better because we're not removing the oils or any of the meal outside of the filet and the cold process just keeps all your heat sensitive nutrients and vitamins, you know, 
everything intact. So it's like a, a vegetable that's been boiled to death versus one that's been just steamed or raw. It's got a lot more nutrient in it for you. And it's just, it's not thick. It's not nearly as smelly. I mean, it's not perfume, but it's not disgusting like fish emulsion. So it's a lot easier to apply and it's just a lot better product. And the fish we catch is caught well offshore, the very cold, clean, you know, mineral rich North Atlantic Ocean. So it's, it's all higher quality fish than the Gulf of Mexico or Chesapeake Bay quality um, as far as pollutants go. Yeah. Well, and that's great that it's also something that, you know, it's basically a byproduct. I mean, that's, that's great that you were paying to get rid of this stuff before, and now you're turning it into something that is useful um, for people. What is the nutrient analysis on uh, Neptune's Harvest then? So it's a two four one NPK, and um, mm -hmm. it also has so those are your macronutrients. It also has micronutrients, trace mm -hmm. elements, amino acids, vitamins, enzymes, minerals, growth hormones that are naturally in fish that make fish grow, plus all your omega oils. So it very much increases the relative feed value, total digestible nutrients, and grows very nutrient dense food. So it's it's really healthy for um, for your crops and for you and for your soil. Yeah. And um, so like you said, does mi mixing so many different batches, does that keep that pretty consistent or do you test the tanks from time like time to time just to make sure it's within that rough analysis? Oh, yeah, we test it all the time. Um, and it's like I said, it goes through a 10,000 gallon mixing tank. So, you know, if we process a lot of one species one day and another another day, it still goes through that 10,000 gallon tank. So it's very consistent all the time. And, you know, you have to make sure those NPK ratios are, are correct because label registration people will pull it off a shelf and test it. And if, if it's not right, you'll, you'll, you know, they can issue a stop sale and fine you and whatever. So it's, it's very consistent. Okay. Yeah. That, that's what I was thinking. I, I was figuring it had to be pretty consistent because I, I do know there are labeling laws. Um, so I guess it must be a whole different business from, um, from the seafood business, but I guess similar in, in certain ways that there's, there's certain quality standards and, and, uh, things like that. Um, so your, is your, your family still also, um, in the seafood business too, or have you switched over completely to Neptunes? Nope, we're still in the seafood business. Uh, my grandfather bought the dock that where where we unload the boats about 100 years ago, and then he sold it to my dad in 1965. And then when my dad passed, he left it to the five kids. Plus, I had an uncle that was involved, and so his kids. I have cousins that are owners. Out of 45 employees, 16 are family. We're working on our fifth generation now. My sister's grandson works here. So we're, we're on to the fifth generation and it's still Ocean Crest Seafoods is still unloading boats every day. And, you know, we're an operational seafood company. And then the fertilizer division between the two businesses, it's about 45 employees combined. Wow, that's great um, to see a family business grow like that. So uh, uh, on the seafood side of things, are you wholesalers? You're like selling, you know, like bulk quantities to I don't even know how the seafood business uh, works. Or are you retailing um, fish? Uh, we're wholesalers. So we sell, you know, mostly whole fish. We, we do have one cutting room for local restaurants, but mostly it's whole fish that goes to Boston, New York, Baltimore, and then distributed from there through fish markets and fish dealers all around the country. But yeah, we, we don't sell to the public. Uh, we just sell to other seafood companies. Mm-hmm. And are you, you're, is all the gurry coming from your operation or you, you're buying fish leftovers from other, other, um, people in, in, uh, Gloucester? Yeah. So it takes 10 pounds of gurry to make one gallon of fertilizer. So if we grind 5,000 pounds of gurry in a day, that only makes 500 uh -huh. gallons of fertilizer. So we do get a lot oh, of wow. fish, you know, get gurry from Boston, New Bedford, um, Portland, Maine, and on, and everything that comes out of Gloucester. Okay, and uh, 
Well, that's one of the things I was wondering about. So there, you're it's like trucks full of fish guts coming down to your plant, basically, and you're <laughs> grinding them all up. Yep, they're refrigerated trucks and they're in big vats, so everything's nice and fresh. And we have a big cooler right at, at our seafood company where we make it. So if it's not going to get ground that day, it goes into the cooler, so it's just as fresh the next day when we grind it. Nothing that we're grinding is rotten fish; it's all fresh, which is the reason our fertilizer doesn't stink to high heaven. We stabilize our fish with phosphoric acid, which is something the plant needs anyway, and emulsions stabilize with sulfuric acid, which is a lot less expensive. That's why they're a 511 and we're a 241, because they boil out half the water and that doubles their nitrogen, but then they stabilize with sulfuric acid. Um, and that's basically why Ours is a two on the nitrogen, there's a five, and ours is a four on the phosphorus, and theirs is a one. Okay, be because the phosphoric acid is adding phosphorus, right? Right. Correct, which is something the plant needs anyway. Okay. It's more expensive than sulfuric right. acid, but it's a lot safer to work with. It makes a better product, and it's still approved organic by Omri, as long as you're only using enough to stabilize the fish fertilizer, not fortify it which is all we do. We just use enough to get the pH down to 3.5 and Omri approves that as organic still. Right. Okay. Well, that, that is important because, you know, traditionally, I think the main complaint about fish fertilizers is, is the smell. And so that makes a lot of sense if you're cold processing. And so all of your formulations are um, suitable for organic production? Uh, yes, they're not all Omri listed. We have seven products Omri listed and we spend, you know, a lot of money with them every year. So, um, we have a couple new products that have a lot of ingredients that would be very expensive. Um, they do meet the national organic program standards. And if you are certified organic, you can have your certifier reach out to us and we'll tell them what's in it and they'll, um, they'll approve it. So those are, uh, four products that, I'm talking about which is the tomato and veg, rose and flowering, lawn starter, and turf formula. And all four of those have the same ingredients in varying amounts. And they're fish, seaweed, humate, molasses, and yucca extract. So they're all approved organic products, but we didn't spend the money to have those four Omri listed, but they are organic. And every and everything else we sell is Omri listed. Okay. Um, that's great because, um, just in case any of our listeners are newer, uh, Omri is the, I think I'm going to get this right. The organic materials review Institute, and they Correct. do put together a list of products that are generally approved. And so we should say just not to get ourselves in trouble with anybody that if anybody's out there thinking about using a product, it's always a good idea to run it by your certifier, uh, before, using it rather than use something that you think is is okay and then getting in trouble for it later. But that's soup that is really handy for growers to know that something's listed on the Omri list because it's, you know, generally gonna be um, usable for for organics. Um, and so those those other products that that you were talking about, the fish seaweed blend uh, tomato and veg fertilizer, liquid crab and lobster shell. Is that just the, the base of the product is the Neptune's fish and you've added other things for different crops, basically. Is that right? Yeah, well, um, we listen to our customers. These are things like a lot of our customers said, we use Humate, we use molasses. You know, we would love to have a product that had all these ingredients in it and then we didn't have to buy separately. It would make it so much easier for us. And that's kind of how we got into expanding our line and creating products. The seaweed is a great additive. It's not a complete fertilizer by itself, but some people just want straight liquid seaweed. It's fantastic for foliar spraying. It gives you frost protection. It helps with powdery mildew. It, it hardies the plant up against stress. So we have a, a straight liquid seaweed that's Omri listed. Then we have the fish seaweed blend, which is 75% fish, 25% seaweed also Armory listed um, and it's very concentrated. All our products are like one ounce per gallon of water or if you're a big farm, maybe one gallon to 10 gallons of water, putting up two or three gallons per acre at a time. 
but it's very, um, very concentrated, everything we sell. And then we have the uh, dry crab and lobster shell, liquid crab and lobster, which we've micronized so fine that it'll stay in suspension in a liquid. And then we have, um, we have straight liquid humate now, brand new. Um, we have dry kelp meal and then the liquid seaweed, which are the same Ascophyllium nodosum seaweed, which is widely recognized as the best seaweed for agriculture, all grown along the cold water of New England on the shore. And it's cut, it's not ripped off the rocks. So it's very sustainable. It grows back very quickly. So that's a great uh, sustainable resource of minerals. Um, fantastic for root growth. Um, so that's, I think we have about um, 10 liquids and two dry now. Yeah. Oh, cool. Okay. So the, the kelp is coming from uh, uh, like coastal Massachusetts or Maine or some, somewhere up here. Yeah. Yeah. It's um, mostly Maine, but a lot along the shore of New England. Okay, because people may know, I'm uh, my farm is up here in Maine. We're not close to the coast. We're pretty, we're central Maine. We're pretty far inland, but um, it's a pretty big deal. I know there's a lot of uh, organizations that that are harvesting seaweed and also trying to do it sustainably, like you, like you mentioned. Um, and I know people have been using kelp um, for a long time, like by kelp powder or um, the kelp kelp liquid might even be um, easier. Um, cause that, that's the, the species that you mentioned, I couldn't say it again, but that's, it's, it's a form of kelp, right? Yeah. It's called Ascophyllium nodosum. We call it rockweed cause it grows along the rocks. Um, it's, it's got the bubbles that you can pop and the big long brown. If you've ever been to the beach, you've seen it, I'm sure. It's all Oh yeah. The, the big long tails. Yeah. It's yeah. got the big long tails uh -huh. and then it's got the little bubbles you can pop like we did as kids all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, cool. Yeah, no, uh, I know. I I don't even know all the things that um, that kelp is used for, but I do know that it's got a lot of different things in it that people think, um, like you said, give a lot of advantages. And so, with the the liquid crab and lobster, is is that there's a, a more calcium in that? I would think is there um, is that the main selling point on the 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 crustacean formulas. Yeah, um, it, the the dry crab and lobster shell is seventeen to twenty three percent calcium, uh, one point mm -hmm. three to one point seven magnesium. So great cal mag ratio. The chunks will actually aerate your soil, and if you bury it deep in the hole before you plant, the roots will reach for those shell chunks as a food source. So it'll drive your roots really deep. The deeper the roots, the stronger the plant, the higher the yield. Um, plus, it's a 5.30 NPK, so you're getting 5% nitrogen, 3% phosphorus, not a lot of potassium, but that's where the seaweed comes in. The kelp meal has a good amount of potassium, so they're great together. They aerate the soil. They retain moisture in the soil, um, you know, builds organic matter, and, and so does the fish, which really helps sequester carbon. So... You know, the whole world was under ocean water at one time. They found fish fossils on the top of Mount Everest. So it just makes sense how it's been demineralizing over the years. And you put the products from the ocean back in your fields. It really works amazing. Plants love it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that makes sense. Um, I've got a little story that I think you might appreciate, Anne. Um, before we had moved to Maine, we worked on a farm on the coast of Maine. It's a Blue Hill Penobscot area. If anybody knows, it was um, called Horsepower Farm. There, in fact, they're still there. Um, uh, same family running it, and um, as you can guess from the name, they used horses for as much of the farm work as they could. And so, um, in fact, it's that that apprenticeship. Uh, my wife and I apprenticed on that farm, and that's what brought us to Maine, where our farm is now. But um, they were close enough to the coast that that they had built a cement pad and they would get drop offs of um, lobster uh, shells in particular. I guess the, the lobster men, some of them had their own business where they would cook the lobsters, pick the meat, and then they had all the shells left over. So they would come out, jump the dump the lobster shells off. And then there, there are always these seagulls flying around eating, eating the, the leftover um, lobster shells and then when the pile got big enough 
with the farmer, uh, Paul Birdsall, who's who's passed away now, but he was one of our real mentors when it comes to, to farming and also horses. We were interested in horses, uh, horse farming. He would have us go out there with a manure spreader. And uh, in fact, he would load the spreader with a tractor and we would go out and spread it with a, a team of horses. Now, mm-hmm. you know how most manure spreaders have a, a, a spinning part that, that – um, broadcast the whatever you're spreading out the back. Well, occasionally it would ha- hook onto a lobster carcass and th- throw it forward. And so we would always wear our just dirtiest clothes that we cared the least about for that job because occasionally and big hats because occasionally you would get hit in the back of the head with a uh, a lobster carcass. And so um, it sounds a lot better to me to spread it to spread liquid than to go out and spread a bunch of actual dead lobsters. Um, off the back of a manure spreader. So that that might be a selling point uh, for you. It's better than getting hit in the back of the head with a dead lobster. If that's not a selling sales line, I don't know what is. Sounds like a t-shirt to me. (laughs) Yeah, I think so. All right. So um, we already, we talked about the cold processing with just both for smell and um, preserving the, the nutrient content of the, uh, the fish does that mean just mean that the whole the whole processing end of things is under refrigeration the whole time? Uh, no, it's just we don't use any temperature, so it just gets ground up, liquefied, and then stabilized, and then screened. That's it. It's a very simple process. Okay. And um, if someone were looking to to fit fish fertilizer into their rotation would it be um i mean it combines pretty well with other with other fertilizers right or um do you have any tips for growers on either how to get the most out of neptunes or um how to make the most of it so you could start right from soaking seeds plants fertilize Mm -hmm. later in life never catch up to ones that were started right from the soaking of the seed it's fantastic for seedlings and transplant it prevents transplant shock. So a lot of market farmers use it in their planter. It's great for getting the roots off to a really good start. It's a fantastic foliar spray because it's systemic. So it'll actually go in through the leaf down the stem and into the roots. So you get more bang for your buck as a foliar feed, but you have to do it early in the morning when the pores on the leaves are open to accept the morning dew and you don't want to ever spray in the heat of the day. You can do it again in the evening because those pores open again at night, but you don't want to put your plants to bed wet if it's a wet, damp environment because then you can get fungus and disease and things like that. But if it's a very dry climate or a dry year, you could get away with fertilizing in the evening. But ideally, you want to spray all, anytime you fold your spray, kind of crack a dawn before the real hot sun hits them is ideal. So maybe between anywhere from 4 or 5 a.m. to maybe 10 in the morning, that's your window to get all your foliar done. Mm-hmm. Um, but the, yeah, the yeah, results that... are phenomenal as a foliar. I can't uh, stress it enough. I mean, a lot of people use it through drip tape and they still see great results. But if you could throw on a foliar feed, especially any time the plant's going through a stress or a big uh, growth spurt, something like that, you'll be amazed at the difference. It's it's astonishing. It's really great foliar. Right. Because it in a, because in addition to the fertility, it's got the you the different I don't know plant hormones and in, in are that hormones from the fish that may help with stress in addition to just the fertility for growing. Yeah. And it just increases the yield, the size. I mean, we sell to all the giant pumpkin growers. We have the world record for the biggest pumpkin ever grown last year. It was 2,560 pounds grown in Minnesota. He, he loves our products, uses them, swears by them. Um, the biggest um, squash, uh, butternut squash was grown, biggest Squash in the world was grown using our stuff. They got uh, huge watermelons. We have a we have a huge following of giant vegetable growers because it really helps increase the yield, which is obviously what they're going for. Yeah, yeah. Well, that makes sense, and I, I feel like I've seen a lot of growers use it, like you said, when you're watering a crop in. Like particularly, a lot of people when they plant with your first plant a uh, transplant a uh, crop out. They'll either, and if it's on a tractor, they'll have like a water wheel transplanter that's just dripping 
um, liquid into the furrow or, you know, on a smaller scale, people may use a backpack sprayer or something like that. But I figure, I guess I've seen people use that then because you know the plant is going through a little bit of stress. If you think about it, it's going from this nice propagation house where all the um, all the conditions have been optimized going out into the big bad world. And so um, not only does it give it a little bit of fertility, but may help it overcome that just that stressful event of of uh, of getting transplanted out into the field yeah are there any disadvantages or circumstances under which you wouldn't want to use uh fish fertilizer i really don't know of any i am um, i'm pretty sure it works on everything i don't i've never had uh -huh. complaints of it not working on one thing or another it, it's just it makes sense with the the low npk and all the nutrients that it's it's just advantageous you don't, I mean, on a tiny little seedling, you don't want to go too strong. That's why usually I tell people to half the rate and instead of one ounce per gallon, go half ounce per gallon until the first true leaves are out. The, the seedlings may be four or five inches tall and, and starts to show first true leaves, then full strength. But at half strength, you can fertilize every time you water. And then once you go full strength once a week or even every other week, and then the, the real big farmers don't spray as often, so they'll go out a little heavier, less often. But it's always better to go um, more frequently with less than less frequently with more. Yeah, that, that's what I've always heard is just like we want even food and water and temperature and all that kind of stuff. You know, plants also just want things to be consistent. I've, I've heard the same thing that it's it's better to be a little bit more dilute, more frequent than, than hitting them with a whole bunch of fertilizer. But I also get it. Yeah. If, if you're dealing with a big farm, you may not be able to get around to the whole place every, every week or, or whatever. And those dilution rates are on the bucket or on the material with, um, with Neptunes because there's, am I right? There's a different dilution rate, like you were saying for seedlings versus soil soaking versus foliar feeding. Um, yeah, the, well, the, the seedlings is a half ounce, so one tablespoon, and that's on the label. I think it's under um, indoor use. And then outdoor use is the one ounce per gallon, same for soil and, and foliar. And it's on there. And then if you buy the 55-gallon drums and you have several acres and you're going to go less often, um, I have a farm book um, which has the application rates for farm big farms. So they, they might go out with um, three gallons with 30 gallons of water four times a year or something. Um, or they, you know, we, we recommend basically 12 gallons of concentrate per acre per year for most farm crops. Okay. And I know you were talking about it being screened and you said that it could go through drip tape. Um, can you put it through sprinklers? Yes, yeah, so there's a couple things. You, you can't leave it stored diluted for more than a few hours or basically it's going to start to smell like rotting fish. It'll still work, but it'll stink pretty bad. So you don't want to leave it in a reservoir, you know, for days on end. So try to use up whatever you mix within three, four hours tops. I always tell people, how long would you leave a piece of fish sitting on your kitchen counter before you cook it? It's about the same amount of time you'd want to leave the fertilizer diluted. Um, and then the other thing is you have to flush your lines right after running the product through because if you don't, the oils in the fish will dry in there and then it could clog the next time. So immediately when you're done running the fish through your lines, run clear water through the lines for maybe five minutes. That'll flush everything out and you'll be fine. And you want to stir it. You, you got you to gotta shake it and stir it good too. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Because it will se separate, uh -huh. so the oil separate. So you always want to shake it real good, stir it up good before you run it through your system. Okay, right. Because you don't want to just shut the sprinklers off, and then it it probably all in the lines. Okay, so basically, like people should plan to do a little bit more watering than j than just whatever they need to do if they if they're sprinkling an area with Neptunes to just make sure and flush the lines out. It sounds like. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Well, that's interesting because I'd always seen that note on the, the um, Neptunes to um, not leave it mixed up, you know, like basically only mix up what you're going to use. And I had always wondered uh, why that was. And so that um, 
that does make sense to me. All right. Well, that is, um, that's most of the questions that I had for you. Is there anything else that I should have asked you about or that you'd like to talk about? Um, just the, the health of the soil, I think, is really important. It, it will build that organic matter so that everything will drain better, retain moisture better. And the deeper your organic matter, the more nitrogen you can pull from the atmosphere. You could gain about 60 pounds of nitrogen just from the atmosphere with really healthy soil and it'll sequester carbon. So the more people are using products like this, um, you know, the better our environment's gonna be. So it's just got a, a lot of win-wins to the to, to using it. You, you we're not throwing away any fish or utilizing it all. It's all organic. It's feeding, you know, raising the nutritional value into your, your food and greatly improving your soil quality and just really helping the environment. So I think those are some real important things to think about when you're using it, you're going to increase your yield. Um, you know, so it pays for itself easily and the nutritional value is going to be a lot higher because of all the things that are in the fish that, that make really nutrient dense food. Uh, for example, we sell it to farmers that put it on their hay and pasture. They'll spray mm -hmm. half their field with the fish and not the other half. All the animals will go graze where they sprayed because uh -huh. it must taste better to them because it's more nutrient dense. The I had a guy in Colorado tell me one time that his cattle were eating half of the hay compared to conventionally grown or no fertilizer and maintaining very high body scores on half the feed. So that's how nutrient dense it is. They don't have to eat as much. It's not like the empty calories. So that's um, another really good point of trying to, we're all trying to be healthy, right? So I think that um, it's great for animals, it's great for us. Yeah, I, I believe it. You know, we worked on some livestock farms too before we started this one. And um, we figure those guys eat grass all day long. They know, like, you'll you'll see them gravitate towards certain you know, certain plants. And I, I assume it's just like us. They have a certain appetite or they know their body needs a certain thing. So that makes a lot of sense that they would, they would gravitate towards the, um, the hay that's, that's, uh, that's been fertilized. Um, and also, um, th that's a good point that, that Neptunes isn't just like, you know, uh, isn't just the, the macronutrient itself that we're trying to put in there's all that other stuff um which actually makes me um want to ask you about i know you said that the humates are something that are added to um, some of those other formulations that you have which is is what humates are i know there's humic acid um do you know what exactly the humate humates are doing for those formulations so um, humate is like, I describe it as taking the very best from a compost pile and make it into a high powered liquid concentrate. So humate is derived from lignite, also known as leonardite. It, before coal turns to coal, it's lignite. So basically it's really, 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 really old dirt, you know, soil. And um, and this Russian scientist developed a process to extract only what's usable by the plant from the lignite. And that's what we get. It's, it's mined in Pennsylvania where the coal, you know, a lot of coal mines there. So a lot of lignite mines there. And um, what we have is a 12% humic acid, which is pretty common. And you just a little bit goes a very long way. Um, it's, it's like liquid compost, I think is the best way to describe it. So it's, it's got a lot of minerals. It's got a, it really helps the plant through stress. Um, it just has a ton of benefits and mixed with the fish, it's, it's ideal. So, you know, the humate people use a lot of fish and the fish people use a lot of humate. They go really well together. Same as like fish and seaweed. And then the molasses is always, you know, another good additive. And that's why we have that in four, four of our products. Okay. That's interesting. I didn't realize that, that humic acid or the humates were in mind. So, um, but that, that makes sense. Um, that's yeah. Like the best of compost right there. Um, 
Have you ever thought about making a solid version of Neptunes? I'm just curious. Like, I guess you would have to then go through another process to dry it down. But does, um, um, is there a reason you stick to the, the, the liquid? Yeah, because if you dry it, you have to cook it. And if you cook it, you're ruining so much of what's good about the fish in the first place. So oh. basically you're destroying so much of what makes the fish good in that cooking process that it would just be an inferior product. Yeah. Okay. Well, that does, that does make sense. And, um, I guess, I mean, and it's probably easier to use for all applications other than soil in, in the liquid formulation. Right. And if you want to soil feed the crab and lobster shell mixed with the kelp meal is, is just great. So you, you have that option to go with the dry and I put crab and lobster shell and kelp meal in every hole before I plant anything, just a handful in, in, of each in the hole, mix it up good. You don't want a big clump in the root zone. You mix it up good with a little hand rake or something, and then you're ready to put your transplant in. Then you put your liquid fish in with your transplant or fish and seaweed. And that plant is off to an amazing start. And then if you have a really wet year where you don't want to come out and fertilize a lot because everything's saturated already, you don't want to add more liquid, at least you have that crab and lobster and kelp in the soil so those roots are getting a lot of nutrients still. Right. Yeah. Um, well, that yeah, that is a good strategy. I know it can be a lot of work to dig all those holes, but for bigger crops like tomatoes um, and uh if, if the soil isn't really where you already want it to be, um, you know, we've employed that strategy to make some, almost like uh, make some super soil almost by taking a taking a shovel full out, mixing it with some better fertilizer. Because the we've started farms twice and both times it was on run out hay fields, you know, so there wasn't there wasn't a whole lot of fertility, wasn't a whole lot of organic matter. And so we figured a, a plant that's going to be around for the long haul, like a tomato plant, we would just take out a shovel full and and add, you know, add some, some fertilizer to that, uh, to try to try to like make up for what wasn't already there in the soil. And of course, in the long term, we're just trying to make the soil better, but that worked pretty well for us. Um, when we knew that our soil wasn't good to just kind of preload it with some fertility. So that's, yeah. I would think, yeah, that's a good strategy. And you can also broadcast it over the field prior to planting. If you don't want to put a little in every hole, like I'm a small gardener, I, I can dig a hole for every plant and put a little in, but <laughs> if you have a lot of acreage, then you can just broadcast it over, maybe mix it in a little bit, but, um, you don't have to, you know, do it. And, the other thing I wanted to mention um, is it's a great compost enhancer, an accelerator. If you do a compost pile, you can spray the fish and you could get usable compost in half the time. So it's another really great use for the fish is in your compost pile. Oh, right. Is that that's because the, the microorganisms that are heating up the compost pile, they're also going to eat the fish. I mean, I would think that's right. like high, high quality food for them. Okay. Correct. That's exactly what it is. The, the fish is a food source for all those microbes and beneficial bacteria. Oh, right. And so, um, I guess they're going to change the form. They would break it down, but it, it would still, I would imagine that if you added it to a compost pile, the fertility, uh, analysis of that, the original Neptunes is probably still there in the finished product. It's just been transformed by some microbes so that ate it and pooped it back out, right? Yeah, exactly. So okay. it's, 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 you'll have usable compost a lot quicker and higher quality compost. Cool. Well, I think a lot of growers will be happy to know that Neptunes is made from the leftovers from uh, fishing, basically making something of value out of the byproducts from, from seafood. Where can people find you if they uh, uh, look in for your website or social media or wherever you want people to find you? So we have uh, NeptunesHarvest.com as our website. And then we have a Facebook and Instagram, um, YouTube page with some great how-to videos. Just made a commercial if anyone wants to hop on our YouTube channel. I did a 30-second commercial. It's going to be starting to play on YouTube and maybe some local television and and I'm in it. My my son's in it. My, it's everybody in it's either a good friend of mine or family. So it's a pretty funny commercial. Um, you can watch that. But we, um, yeah, we do the social media. We we sell online. Um, we also sell through garden centers. We have distributors like Griffin Greenhouse and BFG, and you know a lot of the BWI down south. Um, a lot of distributors throughout the whole country that sell 
bulk sizes. And if you have a garden center or a, or a store you want to buy by the case, we could sell you from here or through one of our distributors. If you're a farmer that wants drums, um, we have a farm distributor map on our website. You just put in your zip code and the closest farm distributor distributor will come up. If you're a homeowner looking for a store nearby, um, we have a store locator on our home gardener page. We do sell online. If you can't find it locally, um, Amazon sells it. We, we don't sell on Amazon, but plenty of other people do. But, um, you know, a lot of people want five gallon pails. That's, that's a good price over the gallon jugs. But if you're looking for drums, if you're, if you're in New England, by all means, you know, reach out to us, but we have people in New Hampshire selling it and, you know, Pennsylvania, we have a lot of distributors. So we've hopefully find somebody closer to you to save in shipping charges, but we ship all over the country too. It's not as expensive as you might think. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Cause I know, yeah, you know, up here in my neck of the woods, it's not really that far away from where you are, you know, central Maine. Uh, but I know it's around, it's around up here. So that's, that's good to know though, that, that growers may be able to find it already on the shelf or, you know, at a farm store or something like that close to where they live, but they can always order it if they, if, if it's not close by. Right. Yeah. Um, Paris farmers union up in Maine is a big distributor. Um, seven Springs farm in Virginia sells a lot. Um, yeah, so, all oh, right. Seven. Yes. Seven Springs. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm familiar, familiar with them. Okay. Well, um, thanks for coming on the pod and, um, telling us more about Neptunes and I, I appreciate it. And, uh, I think that'll be useful as people are thinking about their, their fertility plans, uh, this spring. Thank you. Appreciate it, Andrew. Yeah. Yeah. Great yeah, talking sure. with you. Uh, and if anyone has any questions, they can always call me at the office. You know, we have an 800 number on our website. More than happy to talk to people. So feel free to reach out. Give me a call or my email is just my name, Ann, A-N-N, at NeptunesHarvest.com. So more than happy to answer questions and get people any information they need. All right, perfect. If I didn't, if I didn't get to all of them, they can just get in touch and ask them themselves. Perfect. All right. Well, thanks, Ann. Um, Thank I enjoyed you. hearing about it, and uh, I think our listeners will too. Thank you.